In the economics of the steady state, Daly argues for the necessity of obtaining a state of zero economic growth and sketches some institutions that would make such a state more desirable. The desirability of a zero growth state dates back to at least mid 19th century when Mill expressed, I sincerely hope for the sake of posterity that they will be content to be stationary long before necessity compels them to it. The zero growth objective of a steady state economy does still allow for progress and development. Daly distinguishes between growth and development, where he proposes to use growth to refer to quantitative increases in the material flows, while development refers to the qualitative increases in the surface we derive from these material flows of throughput. In other words, zero growth does not rule out te technological advance, nor does it hinder the pursuit of happiness. Daly defines a steady state economy as constant stocks of physical wealth, artifacts, and a constant population, each maintained at some chosen desirable level by a low rate of throughput. The throughput is the inevitable cost of maintaining the stocks of of people and artifacts and should be minimized subject to the maintenance of a chosen level of stocks. Efficiency is defined as the amount of surface or happiness that we get per throughput of material flow, where this ultimate efficiency measure can be split up into surface efficiency and maintenance efficiency. The surface efficiency is surface derived per stock and maintenance efficiency refers to the amount of throughput it takes to sustain a certain chosen level of stocks of infrastructure and other artifacts. Note that a steady state economy does not imply constant material flows. For example, technological advance may save resources, while the gradual depletion of the highest grade resources leads to a path of increasing throughput to maintain a certain steady state. Daly explains that neoclassical views on scarcity and wants or needs give rise to what he calls growth mania. From the first lecture in the series, you may remember that relative scarcity refers to the scarcity of a particular resource relative to another resource or to a lower quality of the same resources. Absolute scarcity refers to the scarcity of all resources in general relative to population and per capita consumption levels. Daily defines absolute wants as those we feel independent of the situation of our fellow human beings. Relative wants are those that we feel only if their satisfaction makes us feel superior to our fellows. Here Daly points out that neoclassical economics assumes that wants in general are insatiable and extends to all wants the dignity of absolute status, i.e. the satisfaction of relative and absolute wants is considered equally legitimate and equally capable of satisfaction in the aggregate by means of economic growth. The assumption of equal legitimacy is a value judgment, though it is treated by many economists as the avoidance of a value judgment, and the assumption of equal capability of satisfaction is either a logical error or an implicit acceptance of a value judgment in favor of increasing inequality. Daly subsequently argues that this neoclassical combination of focus on relative scarcity while ignoring relative ones gives rise to growth mania. In Daly's words, if there is no absolute scarcity to limit the possibility of growth and no merely relative ones to limit the desirability or efficacy of growth, then growth forever and the more the better is the logical cons consequence. The implication of absolute scarcity and relative ones is the opposite of growth man mania, namely the steady state. Daly also speculates over what institutions such a steady state economy would need, formulating three clear design objectives to stabilize population and physical wealth while limiting inequality and I guess a fourth stretch goal of achieving allocative efficiency. Daly also proposes four design principles, 
being limiting sacrifices to personal freedom, leaving slack between environmental pressure and capacity, starting from current rather than imaginary conditions uh, to tighten constraints gradually and to put minimum faith in our ability to plan while putting max maximum faith in nature's regenerative power. Before presenting daily his proposed institutions and policies, take a moment to think about how such institutions should look according to you. And let us consider Rawls, his theory of justice, for some help in this. Rawls asks you to imagine a hypothetical position where no one knows his place in society, his class position or social status, nor does anyone know his fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence, strength and the like. I shall even assume that the parties do not know their conceptions of the good or their special psychological propensities. The principles of justice are chosen behind the veil of ignorance. Rawls argued that any party would adopt two such principles from this hypothetical position. First, inspired by Kant, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberties for all. And second, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both a to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, consistent with the just saving principle, and b attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. This point B would banish kings and queens to the fairy tales where they belong. For a clarification on this just savings principle, Rawls elaborates the just saving principle can be regarded as an understanding between generations to carry their fair share of the burden of realizing and preserving a just society. Which institutions would you like to reshape from behind this view of ignorance? And whom did you include in your abstraction? Did it include other species as well? Now let us consider the institutions that Daly proposed. He argued that the steady state would need policy to stabilize population, policy for the maintenance of a certain stock, and policy to address inequality. To stabilize population, Daly considers marketable birth licenses, an idea that I am hesitant to embrace, to put it mildly. Daly is silent about possible unwanted behavioral responses or enforcement issues on how to deal with policy violations. I imagine that serious consideration would lead most to reject state or market influences over the physical integrity of our bodies as much as possible. Besides, population growth is already no longer the main issue when it comes to global sustainability. That is, the focus on population size is somewhat false. For example, when it comes to climate change, a focus on population growth distracts from the extreme inequality in emissions, as we have seen in the first week with Chancel and Piketty, and recently The Guardian headlined an illustrative statistic, the world's richest 1% cost double the carbon dioxide emissions of the poorest 50%, says Oxfam. With respect to governing resource use, Daly clearly favored cap, auction and trade. As he puts, quantitative limits are set with reference to ecological and ethical criteria. And the price system is then allowed by action and ex exchange to allocate depletion quotas efficiently. In a beautiful critique, Bergmeier argues that steady state economics consists in an attempt to squeeze neoclassical economics into a biophysical and ethical corset. And later she writes that introducing a hypothetical when to stop rule on the macro level as if growth could be assumed away distracts from facing economic realities. Bergmeier highlighted unsustainable lock-ins and tra transition pathways as fruitful areas for future research. And I wanted to mention a third here, 
uh, in exnovation. Exnovation refers to the disadoption of inefficient infrastructure, rules or practices. Davidson writes about this. New scientific findings cataloging the need for a rapid renewable energy transition are most often met with calls for innovation. Our failure to address climate change and thereby avoid the socio-economic crisis it foretells will not be attributed to a lack of innovation, however, but rather to a lack of exnovation. Davidson suggests that the disadoption of polluting infrastructure has become more important to address climate change than developing ever more efficient technologies. As an example, one may think of Bell Chateau, the most carbon polluting coal fired power plant, which damage, according to the FISE article, is rooted not in its output but in its inefficiency. More generally, the FISE article highlights that the largest polluters are nearly all amongst the least efficient producers. Exnovation policy could aim its efforts at providing incentives for the disadoption of outdated, inefficient technology. In addition to advocating cap, auction and trade, Daly advocated controlling throughput at the input end. Similarly, the report by Stiglitz and Stern et al. we have seen earlier in the series gave an example of such a policy. In energy importing countries such as Morocco, where 90% of the energy and roughly all of the fossil fuels are imported, tax collection can be accomplished by merely monitoring the ports of entry, making a carbon tax easier to administer and enforce than other mitigation instruments or taxes. Daly pointed out that zero growth policy needs to consider poverty alleviation and social welfare explicitly, since growth can no longer be appealed to as the answer to poverty. Daly proposed to do so by establishing both maximum and minimum incomes. In relation to the latter, we find increasing support for the idea of universal basic income, with experiments taking place in several parts of the world. The idea of establishing maximum incomes seems strangely enough more controversial, yet here in the Netherlands we already have such a maximum income for public positions. Extending such a policy to the private sector may have some practical difficulties, but even here there is a good case for maximum incomes as the 1% or the 0.1% or whatever percent also owes a large part of their success to the public infrastructure. A final policy proposed in Daly, his later work, is to address the money-creating abilities of private banks by establishing full reserve requirements for banks. Here, Dietmer offers an introduction into this literature. Simulations by Jackson and Victor illustrate that zero growth need not be accompanied by rising inequality in their 2016 paper, and that the growth imperative of financial capital does not necessarily lead to growth, again using simulations. Also related, see Callas et al. for a discussion of the economics of degrowth. The Zero Growth Steady State Economics by Daly is by now only one of post-growth perspectives. Post-growth perspectives are theories that consider economic growth as an undesirable policy objective. Here we can distinguish the A growth position that is agnostic to growth. Examples include Ray Worth or Donut Economics circular economy and arguably system dynamic models such as limits to growth and stock flow consistent models. The degrowth literature is the most outspoken opponent of further economic growth. Geng and colleagues argue that there is enormous scope for increased recycling of material flows. The figure shows a sun key diagram of material flows where the width of the flows are equal to its relative size. And the figure illustrates that there is plenty of room for development without growth. Heng and colleagues also write that circular economy concepts are more often celebrated than critiqued. 
While I also celebrate circular economy as a move in the right direction, let me present one critique. That is, the circular economy may be close to a necessary condition for sustainable resource use, but it gives little guidance for the tolerable size of material flows in the circular economy. In other words, the circular economy is far from a sufficiency condition, and perhaps we should first learn how to close the loops before we allow them to expand further. Recently, the idea of donut economics has been gaining popularity. This model starts from the planetary boundaries, which we discussed in the first lecture, that provide an ecological ceiling for economic activity. The donut model adds an inner social foundation based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which express the minimum desired socioeconomic conditions and personal liberties necessary to provide for a happy life. The city of Amsterdam has started to adopt the model to guide policy making. Rayworth and colleagues 2020 describe how to translate the donut model to the scale of a city. To someone interested in biodiversity, it is a bit disappointing that the planetary boundary for biodiversity loss is suddenly reduced to overfishing when applied to the city of Amsterdam. Well, I see advantages of the donut model in the sense that it encourages that policies will be evaluated against multiple criteria. Beyond the adoption of planetary boundaries, ecological ceiling and the integration with the SDG measures for social foundation, there seems to be little of an actual model. I disagree that the tragedy of the commons also concerns the digital commons, but in general think that donut economics offers a nice read. I'm not the biggest fan of the name Donut Economics. I would have preferred LP Record or Final Economics because the music is in the middle. I have now discussed nearly all material from last year. One of the topics that received more attention last year was my surprise over the negative public perception of Extinction Rebellion, especially when compared with the farmer protest. I included a famous quote from former Mexican president Benito Juarez in relation to this, yet this year the quote may be more applicable to discussions around COVID-19 policies. Entre los individuos como entre las naciones, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. It is a shame that we do not seem to agree what those rights of others are. Today, we discussed that there seems to be little evidence in favor of the environmental Kutnets curve or absolute decoupling needed for green growth at rates consistent with sustainability goals. The Jevons paradox informed us not to expect too much from focusing policy exclusively at innovation. From Easterlin's paradox, we learned that economic growth doesn't make us happier. And my review of post-growth perspectives showed that these perspectives have in common that they wish to address economics, economic inequalities and poverty directly rather than promising that growth will take care of it. This slide contains the, an overview of the literature used today. Next week in environmental economics we will talk about environmental change and mental health. For the class of next week I have a request that you watch a documentary before class because I'm interested to hear your opinion. Next week, I will prepare material for at most one hour to leave enough time for Q&A. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions?